What's going on, guys? Welcome to the Phenomenal Fan Podcast, episode number 10. Number 10. We have a very special episode for you guys today. We have Major League player Kent Emanuel on the episode. Made his Major League debut in 2021 for the Houston Astros. Had an excellent first year in the Major Leagues. Is now on his way back in the rehab process from an injury. But we get all of his insight on what it takes to get to where he is, what it's like to be where he is now, especially with all the MLB lockout stuff going on, because as of right now, it's still not resolved and it's not looking like it's going to be resolved anytime soon. So we're going to get all of his information and it's going to be a great episode. So stick around for it. We really appreciate you guys tuning in and strap in because it's a really, really fun episode that we have dialed up for you guys. And uh, let's just jump into it. All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome back to the Phenomenal Fan Podcast, episode number 10. Very, very, very special episode today. Uh, We are welcoming on Mr. Kent Emanuel, Major League pitcher. Um, For those of you who don't know, he made his debut this past season in 2021, and he was very kind uh, to join us today on this fine February 24th, uh, Thursday. As we uh, briefly just touched on talking to him, he's got a little bit more time than maybe he normally would at this time of year because uh, there isn't a lot going on in the world of baseball, unfortunately. But um, Kent, thanks for coming on. We really appreciate it. No, ha- happy to be here. This is my this is my Twitch debut as well. By nice. The way, so happy happy to happy to break the seal. Nice. There you go. <laughs> oh, there you cool, go. Man. Yeah. Yeah, appreciate yeah. it. Yeah, you're good to good to go, man. There's uh there's no pressure at all because I, I think I was pretty new too when I I first started getting on with Ryan. So yeah, I just I, the first I think the first episode I told him to cut like five times and he had to go back and edit for like an hour because of me saying <laughs> yeah. I just cut that out. But yeah, you don't so don't worry about it though. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, yeah, you know, Ken, we have a lot obviously to get into. We wanted to get to know uh you a little bit, I think, because um, you know, we we have experience with playing baseball at a decently high level, but not anywhere near, you know, where you've gotten to. Um, one of our former teammates is actually end up may actually being one of your teammates uh, this season. Uh, his name is Julian Garcia. He's a, he's a pitcher up and uh, he got up to AAA this year with the Phillies. So um, yeah. So, you know, we, we talk to him a lot and we get a lot of insight from him, but we know that everybody's path, right. is so different and go through, you know, going through all the, ups and downs of high school and college and the minor leagues. But um, before we even get into any of that, we just wanted to kind of get the lay the groundwork, right. And find out where, you know, your baseball career started, what got you into baseball from the very beginning. Yeah. Um, honestly, I, I don't, I don't really know. I, I always tell people and they're surprised with this answer that, uh, you know, I'm just, I just love sports and I love competing baseball specifically really actually wasn't, you know, it's not like I grew up like baseball, baseball, baseball. I just love to compete. I love to play sports and, and baseball was, you know, that Avenue that I could, you know, take it to age, you know, take it to age 29 now. So, um, so yeah, it's, it started when I was young. I played, you know, all kinds of sports growing up and, and baseball was always, always one of those that I played every year. And, and I was just fortunate enough to be able to keep playing. Nice. Um, yeah, nice, I mean, yeah, we figured, yeah, as I say, we figured, uh, like Ryan, you said that you saw him, be, he was pretty wet behind the three point line in basketball too. As yeah. Well, right? <laughs> yeah. We, so that's what we were, yeah, we were going to get into a lot of that. I mean, obviously you were drafted out of high school, you know, um, mm-hmm. what, what kind of went into the decision? Obviously you obviously, you know, you had college offers, you had big decisions to make. Um, and for a lot of people right. that people that maybe don't know, I mean, you can't, you can't do both. Obviously you can't play pro ball you can, and go to college at the same time. So what was the thought process going into weighing those options with, you know, the college offers drafted out of high school? Was right. it, was it parents? Was it, you know, what, what, what was the ultimate deciding factor for that? Yeah. So going, uh, in high school, going through the draft process, you know, pretty, pretty close to the draft. I basically came out, um, to, the, to all the, uh, major league clubs and i basically said hey this this dollar amount is sure if you can provide this dollar amount i will sign if not i will go to college so i i essentially 
created a value, you know, what I valued my uh, commitment to UNC at. And, um, you know, and that once I kind of slipped, you know, I was, I was probably looking at second or third round if, you know, getting picked. And I knew, you know, the slot money in the second round at that time would have, would have maybe it would have been close sure. to sign. So once I did, once I didn't get drafted in those rounds, it was, um, you know, and I, I think I went to 19, it essentially became, you know, the pirates reached out and said, Hey, we, you know, if we don't sign some of our top guys and we have this extra draft money, we can, we can provide it. And then you can sign. I said, great. And they signed their guys. They didn't have the, the extra cash. And, it, and so my decision was pretty easy. I kind of preemptively, you know, gave myself a, a framework. It's like, if I can get this, I'll go. If not, I'll go to college. And, and I didn't have to think about it, uh, you know, after that. So. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's obviously, well, it's, a, it's a great safety valve, right? Right, right? Obviously to have, you know, to fall back on, right? A UNC scholarship. But just quickly, was there other schools or were you like was it a commitment to unc or was there like you know i guess like unc obviously knew about this as well but like how did that right. process go um no no there were absolutely other schools and, and my decision I, I spent a lot of time and it was hard for me to to decide on where to go um and you know and actually you guys mentioned basketball basketball actually was a small factor because i was that's one of our questions going somewhere where i could do both and and, um, but anyways, I, I ended up, you know, committing to UNC, but that was a year before, um, the draft year. So that was before my junior season okay. of, of, um, or I'm sorry, that was between my junior and senior season in high school. I made my commitment to UNC. So then when it came draft time, you know, it, it only UNC was on the table because I had already sure. selected my school. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, can't, what what age do you think you were like in high school? Like, what year was it when you realized like you had something special coming out of the arm? Like, was it or is it like a consistent thing? Like, when you're playing little league, you were always threw harder than everybody else, or was it like you started developing, you started probably sprouting up and getting a little bit taller, and maybe you're 14, 15 years old, and you throw that first fastball 85 when everybody else is yeah. throwing 72, um, and you kind of started to realize, hey, I'm special. Right. <laughs> um, no, I I think it was a pretty consistent thing. Um, I felt like I was always you know, our top pitcher growing up on whatever team I was on. And, um, you know, and it just, I just was so competitive that, you know, even at a young age, I was like, Oh, I'm going to be, I'm going to be a pro athlete. I'm going to be a pro athlete, you know? So, um, it just, it just kind of, just kind of worked out that way. Cool, man. Yeah. Great. Um, and then we, you know, we touched on basketball already, but that's, that's one of the things we had lined up was, you know, you know, we, 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 did some research and found out that mom played a little ball in college. Uh, and yeah. so, you know, did that, first of all, did that contribute to uh, the uh, high field goal percentage that you sounds like you had in high school? And number two, uh, you know, was there any actual, you know, pretty serious college basketball, either offers or aspirations or anything like that? No. Yeah, there, there definitely, there definitely was. I was, I, I loved playing hoops and, and I was pretty good at it. You know, I, I wasn't, um, you know, playing baseball, I'm like, okay, I could be a professional here. Obviously, the NBA is a whole different ball game, especially as a, a six four uh, slow guy. You know, so. Yeah. Um, but, but uh, no, it was it was absolutely a thing. I loved playing, and and I really did think about going somewhere other than Carolina where I could play both sports. Um, and yeah, my mom, my mom was certainly a, a factor in terms of you know, loving, loving basketball. And so was my dad. They both were. Um, so yeah, I just kind of grew up in a, in a sports household and we loved competing and playing games really, no matter what it was. Absolutely. Yeah. Quick, quickly to touch on that too. And this is, this is something we wanted to get your opinion on, but you know, and I just kind of added it in here, but it crossed my mind last night when I was thinking about this interview and you know, it's so, it, it's such a controversial topic, not in necessarily a horrible way nowadays, but so many kids at such a young age get specialized so quickly and become baseball, mm -hmm. baseball, baseball year round, especially you, you know, down in, in, in the Southeast, you know, you're able to play so much, but basketball right. butts up right up against baseball. And do you think that it's more important for kids coming up, whether it's, you know, just in the youth or in high school or even college to focus on more so being an athlete? than specializing in one sport or, you know, maybe it's case by case. Do you think it helped you 
being a two sport athlete to kind of keep your mind off baseball and then dive back into it once it was season. Yeah, I'm I'm 100 percent a strong supporter of of kids playing multiple sports. I think it's important. I think it makes you just a better athlete and it's going to I think it I think it's going to make you better at whatever sport you end up choosing in the long run. I really do. Um, you know, I feel like yeah. it's it's you know, if I go through my our major league clubhouse, it's hard to find guys that only played baseball only growing up, you know, and I yep. don't think that's a coincidence. So, um, yeah, I would encourage all the, the youngsters out there to 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 play everything and anything at, at all times. Absolutely. And I feel like I feel like it, it definitely probably had to help you a little bit too, like just going through the different mental scenarios in different sports, right? Because if you specialize early and like say you're just a pitcher at a young age. So you get so locked in on that. That's the only task that you're doing. That like that's the only way that your brain can like function and compete. But when you're playing basketball, you're probably able to use things from basketball and bring them with you onto the baseball field as part no, of your arsenal. Yeah, 100%. mentally, you, you can you can grab stuff from all different kinds of sports and and use it. You know, uh, and use it in other in other sports. So yeah, like I said, I, I definitely am a <laughs> firm believer in and guys playing yeah. playing multiple sports yeah that's great i mean we we agree you know we both we both played and i was uh i don't know about jerry but personally it was pretty bad in the batter's box so i got po'd pretty early on but you know it's it wasn't by choice you know if i had a choice i would have played and i played a lot of sports growing up and i think these kids nowadays unfortunately have gotten so specialized that they lose kind of their their childhood you know aspect of being able to play sports and football and you know it's important but um, yeah, we definitely agree. And, and to wrap up the high school kind of conversation, you know, UNC, obviously out of state for you. Um, mm -hmm. was that your, you know, what, what made it into, what went into the decision for being, you know, UNC was the final, was the final place you settled right. on? Um, you know, I wanted, I certainly wanted to be in a competitive conference and on a team that was going to compete at the highest level. Um, and I also wanted to be, you know, I didn't need to be close to home, but I wanted to not be on the complete other side of the country. So, so that kind of narrowed it down to the ACC and the SEC for me. Um, and then from there, it was really hard. Actually, I had a hard time <laughs> picking there. Were a lot, you know, there are a lot of great schools that have a lot to offer. Yeah. Um, so when it, you know, when push came to shove and it came to decision time, um, I remember, uh, being asked the question, Hey, which which school would would uh, would make you the most upset if they took away their offer? And and I was like, you know what, UNC would. And it just kind of it let me tap into to kind of my gut feeling as to where I felt like I wanted to go. And and once I kind of framed it that way and and realized that had that moment, then I I pulled the trigger. Yeah, it's a great. That's a good reason. I mean, it makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. So you you go to UNC, right? You're a freshman. Going into your freshman year, were there expectations before the season? You know, does Coach Fox pull you aside and say, you know, obviously you can tell going through fall ball, going through winter ball, that, you know, you might be able to be, you know, contributing to the team as a, as a true freshman. Mm -hmm. Was there an expectation going into that year to, to have as many contributions as you did uh, for that freshman year? Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, at least, at least I thought so. Um, and... You know, I think that, you know, at the end of the fall, so I was, I was hitting too when I went to college. Okay. Um, and, at the, and at the end of the fall, um, you know, once, once they kind of took the bat out of my hand, that was kind of like the telltale sign at UNC that like, Hey, you're going to be a starting pitcher basically. And, sure. And so that was kind of like my unofficial, uh, you know, the unofficial word I got from them that, you know, I was going to be starter and, and so obviously that was very exciting. And then going into the year, you know, I, I don't think anyone has, you know, holds themselves to a higher standard than myself. So, um, so yeah, I definitely expected to contribute. That's great. Yeah. It's important to, I think for, for kids too going into college to not, you know, there's a lot of I feel like expectation where it's just going to be juniors and seniors, but you look at a lot of these teams that have contributed and obviously we'll get to your contribution and all the way up to Omaha, you know, freshmen, can win teams national championships, win teams conferences, true freshmen, 18 year old kids, um, which is pretty crazy. But, you know, you go through your freshman year and you, you can't get any further than, than what you guys got, you know, going all the way to, to the world series. Um, what's going through your head, taking the mound 
against a team like Texas as a true freshman, you know, in Omaha? What, what's what's the mindset going into that game? What's the expectation for you? I know you you have high expectations, but is a complete game yeah. shutout on on the mind? You know, <laughs> no, honestly, I don't I don't really think there was a whole lot of you know thinking that went into it. You know, um, it was obviously exciting and, and I had a lot of energy and I feel like I've always been good at channeling, channeling that when I, you get those, like that, that energy boost. And, um, you know, I tried to do that. I'm sure, I'm sure it being the early game and not the night game probably helped too. Cause sure. I wasn't awake enough for long <laughs> after the day to, to like, yeah. to think about it too much. But, um, you know, it, we, we had lost our first game there. So if we had lost that game, we were out. And I know none of us wanted to do that. So, um, you know, I was, it was just kind of one of those games where it just kind of happened. I, you know, I, I remember uh, uh, telling people this all the time, how, you know, I feel like the game just kind of ended. And all of a sudden I'm like in the locker room, like, oh, we, we get to stay a couple more days. Yeah. It's great. So, yeah, I don't know. It just kind of happened. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, uh, it kind of goes back to t what you were touching on when you're, when you're talking about when you're first getting into baseball, how you just loved competing and just love the competitive aspect of it. It's kind of like with that old saying, but it's like for a pitcher's version where it's like, don't let the fear of striking out, keep you from playing the game. Well, there's a, I feel like there's a lot of baseball players out there. They're they're They don't ever live up to their expectation because they're worried about their performance, but you're just out there trying to compete. You're out there trying to be a dog for your team. So you guys don't have to go home. Was that, was that your mindset kind of approaching that though? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for sure. And you know, I, I try to tell pitchers this all the time, like, Hey, you know, you have as a pitcher, you have the advantage, right? Yeah. You know, a 30% success rate getting hits is, is gigantic for a hitter. So yep. it's like, you have the advantage. What are you worried about? You know what I mean? Yeah. Go get the guy out. <laughs> yeah. hundred yeah. percent. And that's a, it, yeah. that's a, that's a great mindset to have. That's that probably can contribute to some, to some of that success early on, especially. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And then, you know, you go through, we mentioned the complete game shutout, you finish the game. Um, you guys come up short, obviously, uh, you know, that's a tough thing to go through, but building on a freshman year like that is obviously a lot easier to uh, have a pill to swallow, right. Than than having to be, you know, you deal with the seniors graduating and stuff like that, but you finish the freshman year, uh, on a high note personally. Um, and then mm -hmm. quickly, you know, you head over to the Cape Cod, um, and for people yeah. that don't know the Cape Cod, it's just. I guess the best way to describe it is just a really, really competitive collegiate summer baseball league um, with, I mean, any game you go to, you'll end up coming across a handful of guys that'll end up being be big league contributors, you know, including yourself. So how, how was your general experience? If you could, I mean, it's hard to, you know, I'm sure cover the whole thing, but your experience right. in Cape Cod, how was that for you as a, as a develop, you know, development tool for you and as a pitcher, as a, 18 or 19 year old kid how was that experience yeah I, I if i'm being completely candid i don't think my experience you know there did much for me developmentally compared to some other guys and i know a big factor was us going to the world series um because i show up really late in the summer yep and then i ended up breaking my hand um towards the end of that summer. So I think I only had like four games or something. So I, I didn't really actually get a whole lot of game action. I don't, I don't remember how much I pitched, but it wasn't a whole lot. And, uh, but I do remember, you know, like you said, being on teams with all these extremely talented guys, it, it, it was, it was really cool. And, and, you know, um, you know, you, you have your host families and whatnot, and it's kind of a pretty cool little community and, and, uh, you know, I still, I still am in contact with my Cape Cod host family every once in a while, which is really nice. So, so yeah, it was, it was, um, it was a good experience for me, but honestly, from the baseball standpoint, there wasn't a whole lot of experience. Yeah. Yeah. I see. I mean, we see if I, I see five games, you know, so yeah, that's tough yeah. to, it's tough to do a lot with five games. And I know it's short summer anyways, whether you get there early or not, you still probably would have ended up with, you know, eight to 10, you know, starts if you're a starter. So yeah, I just, you know, it's it's interesting to hear because for some guys, you know, it's position, maybe positionally, they, they didn't get maybe quite the at-bats, you know, or the action, but you obviously had a lot of action right. as a freshman. So, um, you know, developmentally, was just curious more than anything because some guys go and it's a huge yeah. jump for them, you know, and they, they no, make a it, big it, impact. It is, it's crazy how different it is for everyone case by case. There are some guys where it's absolutely gigantic. Yeah. Um, they're going to be there, so... 
so yeah, I mean, it's it, everyone's experience there is different. If you if you have the opportunity to go play, go play. You know, check yeah. and see because because maybe it'll maybe you'll be one of those guys where it's the difference maker for you. Yeah. And your uh, in your limited experience there, I know you said that you you didn't actually end up playing a whole ton of baseball, but there was was there anybody that you like played against? You said this guy's just it, and then that actually came into fruition. Um, that you can remember. Yeah, so I was teammates with Andrew Heaney. And he was dealing, and we're like, "Oh, this guy's going to the show," and yeah. he certainly was. Uh, yeah, so, it goes but, into fruition. <laughs> you know, it was there. There were plenty of guys like that, um, and, and and honestly, with my year specifically, I felt like there were more guys who actually didn't make it, which was surprising. You, you know, I feel like there were a ton of guys who are like, "Oh my gosh, this guy," and then yeah, and then I, I've never seen him again, and it's kind of it's interesting. Yeah. Uh, you know, I feel like I feel like it was kind of a funky a funky summer as a whole. And then with my team specifically, it was a pretty funky team too, because I feel like if I remember correctly, our pitching staff was lights out, but our lineup was uh, lowest in the league. So we like had this, we barely made it in the playoffs, but then yeah. made it to the championship. It was like kind of a weird, it was just kind of a weird, uh, it's just weird how it all played out that summer. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely, yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's, it's a good thing. I mean, for, you know, it's just, I've, you know, as, as baseball guys, we all know, but um, it's one of those aspects I feel like of baseball that, that doesn't necessarily get college baseball in general, maybe not getting as much recognition, but summer college baseball is one of those things where you don't really think about it. You don't realize that you, like we said, you could go up to this show up at any Cape Cod game and come across a guy that'll probably be contributing in the major league mm -hmm. somewhere. So it's a, it's a unique yeah. league for those of, you know, our listeners that don't, don't know it quite as, as well as we do, but you finish the Cape Cod, you go into your sophomore year and what are the expectations getting put on the preseason golden spikes watch list? Is there, do you feel that there's more pressure to, to, perform at the same level or better or what's the mindset when you see that list come out and and Kent's name is on there um yeah no I mean like I said before I don't think anyone had no one has higher expectations for me than me so it, it makes it makes those things really easy because I'm already like I'm already <laughs> right. expecting more out of myself yeah than that. um and but um yeah I mean after the after the freshman season I had and, and that our team had we were we had you know, high hopes for my sophomore year. And, and, um, you know, it was just, it was one of those, it was nice kind of having an established role too. Cause I obviously as a freshman, like I said, I, I kind of figured out I was going to be a starter, but I didn't know for sure. Like there's no way to know for sure. So it was kind of nice to have that established role in the back of your head. So you can just kind of attack the, attack the year and, and kind of just commit to it. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. That's like what Joe Burrow just said uh, too about his his uh, his time with um, the Bengals right now. It's like the first time he's never been chased and he's had an established position in almost in his entire career. So yeah, that's like he was able, he's actually able to focus on the sport rather than the guy behind him. Yeah, so it, that's pretty pretty wild. It's everyone's a little everyone's different. I feel like I'm the type of guy where if I'm running a race, I do better if I'm in first and I can widen. I'm better at widening being in first rather than the right. guy that's got to chase. But some people are better when they're behind the guy to chase. So, you know, everyone's a little different. Um, for me, uh, for me, I, I was happy that that was a situation that I could really lock in. Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> your preseason high expectations certainly uh, lived up to it. Sophomore year, sub two ERA. Things are going really well at, you know, from a personal standpoint uh, at UNC for you. So you finish the sophomore year and, mm -hmm. you know, you guys don't quite have the, uh, you know, full June season experience, but right. you finish that season and you're going into junior year. You've already dealt with sort of the pro ball aspect. You've had communications with, with teams going into this season. You know that it's your draft year. So what is that process like for you as far as, like we mentioned, in contact with major league teams? Are there, are you already getting, you know, the, the pamphlets or the player, the player, um, uh, whatever they're called, the, the questionnaires and all that stuff. Yeah. 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 So, well, so yeah, one of the, one of the great things about, you know, if you end up going to a big school like UNC and, 
and you're kind of in a great program like that is that stuff kind of kind of disappears uh the scouts do come and they'll have we what we would what we did do is we would have um all the draft eligible guys that teams wanted to see they would the scouts would come in and we would literally just have like a meeting with them and we would knock out like five teams a night and we would we did that for a couple weeks until they were all done and that was it didn't have to worry about pamphlets questionnaires talking to anyone that was that's definitely one of the perks of being you know, and, and kind of the upper echelon of college baseball is because the baseball can speak for itself at that point. There's not, they don't need to do as much homework, on, you know, compared to a 17 year old kid who's sure. playing against 14 year olds that he's going to overpower no matter what anyways. So, um, so yeah, it, it, it was really nice. Not, there's not really as much um, action as you would think, um, you know, when they're uh, for my junior year. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting to hear that because, like you said, I mean, we we played with a, a gentleman who who got you know picked up, and he was coming from a Division two school with us, and he did have to go through all that stuff, and he's getting questionnaires delivered to the the you know receptionist at the athletic office, you know, and she's right. got to get it. So it's a different experience for everybody, and it's interesting to hear yeah. that. Um, and like you said, you know, you can see it on these games nowadays are televised the kids jack lighters throwing a, you know 97 miles an hour you like this is we can see it you know right. we don't and we yeah. know he's a good kid so it's interesting to hear that but um you know the, the junior year unfolds for you you guys go back to omaha mm -hmm. and um you know successful again for you another great year and you know then you you sort of deal with coming across in some of our research you know a, an article that comes out oh i think we lost jared but there he is. Um, an article comes out. Oh. You're good. An article comes out in the New York Times about your workload. And, yeah. you know, it's interesting to come across this because, again, it goes back to the, the talk about kind of being an athlete or being, you know, more of a workhorse than maybe, you know, people expect you to. Or in this case, you know, for you, there was just a question about your workload and more scrutiny, I guess, for the coach than you, because you're going to do whatever coach tells you. Right. And until you're hurt or you can't do it, you're going to go out there and compete. So right. having this sort of more national attention, right. In an article like this, um, does that have any impact on you? Does that, does that, you know, in the back of your mind, is that something you're thinking about where if coach is going to call, call on me again, should I, you know, should I tell them no? Or, you know, what, what's the thought process right. in that situation? No, uh, no, there was, there was nothing like that. Um, you know, uh, I, if I remember correctly, I think that, I think, I think I remember getting interviewed by the walkthrough guy and that was while we were already in Omaha. So, yeah. you know, I had one game left after that, maybe right. two, I don't know. And, and they were starts. So it, it never really came up again in terms of being relevant and having that in the back of your mind, if that situation came up again, but um, no, I mean, you don't, you don't really think about that. I, you know, as you guys know, the, the camaraderie of a college baseball team is, is unlike anything else. So once you make it to the college world series, it's, I mean, it's all in on just winning the guys, you know? Yeah. yeah. You guys, yeah, you guys yeah. want to do it. So, so yeah, it's it, too much, too much, uh, too many good vibes going around to be worried about something like that. Sure. Sure. No, absolutely. I mean, and Jared and I, you know, we're going through this and in all honesty, not that, you know, these, these guys job is to, to sort of maybe nitpick some stories and create some situations that aren't necessarily that big of a deal. Um, and not to say that it it's maybe the best or the worst call, but 200 it's quoted in this article is 238 pitches out of your arm in eight days. And you kind of start to take a step back and think about that. And I think for you, it was two starts in a, and relief appearance or something like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, 238 pitches in eight days back in, you know, the, the olden days, right. They like to say the six seventies and eighties, these guys are throwing complete games every single time they go out there. Nolan Ryan's throwing 170 pitches a game. And so it's interesting to, to come across an article like this and have your coach being scrutinized where, you know, at the end of the day, your coach knows what's best for you and you know, what's best for yourself as well. So um, it was interesting to just come across that and, and do the math and realize, you know, that's 115 pitches. That's two starts, you know, that's basically what two starts yeah. would be worth. And, and it just didn't seem like that big of a deal, you know? Right. Yeah. I think the, I think the big deal was, you know, I, I threw, I started the first game of the regional and then I threw two innings 
in relief and in, in maybe the last game in the regional, which was two days later or something. And, and, um, you know, I, I don't know this for sure, but I'm willing to bet that actually my sophomore year is the reason why, um, because, you know, my sophomore year, we, we got upset in the regional by St. John's and, um, we lost a game where I was, I was on cruise control. I got, I got taken out after the eighth inning and we lost in the ninth. We, and then we ended up lose, getting eliminated. And I, and I, I think the coaches my junior year were kind of in the mindset of like, all right, now, now we're here in the playoffs. Like if we're going to lose, we're going to make sure it's, you know, our guys that we want out there losing. And, um, and, you know, and I think, and I'm, I'm happy it worked out that way because it led to me getting to throw the last out to go to the world series, my junior year in a relief, in a relief appearance. So that was cool. But, but yeah, it, it was, it was, um, I don't think it was as big a deal as, as it was made out to be. Yeah, definitely. And can, and can and actually, I was talking to Ryan a little bit about this too. And, it, and just from watching like some of, uh, some of your outings that, that we were able to see on YouTube, um, it's kind of, don't you think it's so, it's so dynamic from guy to guy too? like what, what too many pitches is. If you're a long, like a long and loose guy compared to like a roll this Chapman where you're just max effort every single pitch. Don't you think like, that's like maybe a hundred or 200 pitches a ton for like a roll this Chapman to throw, but for you as a starter, that's kind of on cruise control and you have a nice smooth uh, motion. That's not very herky jerky. Like, don't you feel like that's some sort yeah, of like a, a dynamic number that moves around for each guy? Yeah, it's, it's a very it's a very, very tricky situation because certainly 110 pitches one day for a guy is definitely different than 110 for another guy, yep. you know, given there's so many variables that you can't really, you can't really come up with a, a right number, a, pin, a pinpoint uh, number for exact, every guy. Exactly. Exactly. And then, and then, you know, and as far as like arm health, like in future and whatnot, that's, that's also hard too. Cause you just never know. It's just so hard to, we just don't know. We just simply don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 You just kind of got to use the best, the best information that you have yeah. to, yeah. to do the right thing. So 100%. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So, you know, that, that's uh, like you said, it didn't seem like it was that big of a deal. And, and, you know, we've dealt with, with similar stuff and it's just, it's a uh, case by case. So it's good to hear that, you know, you weren't in the back of your head, like what the hell's coach doing, you know, sending me out there. Cause obviously everybody right. wants to compete. And even if you were hanging, I'm sure one of those, outings or one of those starts right. so you would have gone out there and given it everything you had no matter what if it if it was a if it was like a chronic thing all year then yes but you know it wasn't like that and it was playoff time yep. you have three weeks to try and make a run for a national championship so you, you see in the big leagues too That's you see starters was... come out of the pen in the big leagues. yeah so, absolutely you know, exactly you work all year for that moment you're you know, if there is a time to do it, that's the time. Absolutely. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, you've yeah, seen you, the, the last, definitely the last few postseasons you touched on, but I think it's a, even in the last few World Series games that have been closed out by, you know, the Red Sox. Chris Sale closed out their World Series clinching game. Uh, the Astros, when they won their World Series in 17, Charlie Morton closed it out, you know? Right. So these are starting pitchers right. that are out there getting these last outs because like you said this is our best option these are our best guys and in, in unc's case ken is our best option right now so that's who they went with and yeah i i mean we definitely agree with you that as long as it's it's you know within your you know you're not doing detrimental stuff to your arm it's it's what it takes to win so yeah it's important to yeah. to note that but you know you finish the year 2013 you know you're getting drafted what is yeah. what is the uh, draft day look like for you? Are you with family? Are you on the couch? Are you getting? I know it's not quite as much you know fanfare as it is now with the MLB Network and your name popping right. up and stuff like that. But what does draft day look like for you after uh, junior year? When I got drafted, we were getting ready for a super regional, so I was actually. When I actually when I got the news, I was actually in the middle of a in a work uh, middle of a workout with our team, uh, preparing for the super regional coming up. Um, so, you know, I didn't really have um, that experience where it's like sitting around watching. Right. You know, right. I, I was it was literally it was literally like I, I'm pretty sure if I remember correctly, which I probably don't, 
but I think we just <laughs> finished like warming up for a lift and I went and checked my phone and that's how I got the news. Like I saw it. <laughs> nice. <laughs> I knew like the draft started at, at noon or whatever. Yeah, was, sure. So, you didn't, um, you didn't put on a hat or anything. No, no hat, nothing like that. <laughs> even, even in high school on draft day, I, I remember going golfing just so I wouldn't have to like worry about. Yeah. I, I'd say just so, cause you know how slow time can go when you're just sitting there waiting. Yeah. So, and uh, then did you yeah. know, did you know it was the Astros? Like, was it, was that the team that, you know, was in the most contact or how did that unfold as far like did you have no, no clue no, or I, so i actually um i was actually pretty upset after the draft <laughs> because I was, I was anticipating to go higher um you know i remember the astros had a pick at like 40 something in that supplemental round and we thought if i was going to go to the astros it would be there um so once that supplemental round passed and we got in the second round it was kind of like we didn't think the Astros were on the table because that wouldn't be available until the first pick of the third round. And we didn't think I'd make it there, but, but I did. So, uh, you know, the rest is, the rest is history there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then, you know, last piece on the draft here, 2013 draft for you, um, you know, 74th overall, and you're looking at that list, obviously the, the group of guys that went high in the first round, a lot of them end up, you know, contributing in the major leagues at some point. There's a lot of guys that don't going through this list uh, as well. Mm -hmm. Looking at where you go in, <clears throat> is there any thought that goes into, or maybe just it's a more than anything, maybe a moral victory to to go through this list and come across guys or see guys, or do you talk to any guys in the 2013 like, hey? Bellinger, you know, like, hey, man, I was above you or anything like that. I know that I'm sure there's no just just fun <laughs> yeah, in games. But yeah. looking at that group, you know, there's a ton and just a crazy amount of guys that went after you that yeah. are big league all stars. I mean, MVP candidates yeah. to a certain extent. Is that something that ever crosses your mind? Like, hey, that's Cody uh, Bellinger right. winning MVP. I went before that guy, you know, or anything like that. Right. No. Um, outside of like the. Astros picks from 2013 that I played with I probably I probably couldn't name five other guys yeah, like I, I have no idea interesting so, uh, you could you could name off a ton of names and I'm sure I'd be surprised that they were in my draft class about yeah 90 percent yeah well just Jeff, Jeff McNeil yeah Luke just Trevino. just to give you some names yeah Ch Chad Green they're all behind you Mikey Shremsky was behind you Bellinger was behind you uh Ben Attendi Kevin Biggio I mean these are all yeah. you know big league contributors right. and and to to further that point though I mean not that it sounds like you didn't you know know too much about it but you know is there is there any sort of you know positive that can come out like these guys went behind me you know and they're contributing at a big league level there's no reason why i shouldn't be at that same spot you know soon um sure i mean i'm sure that could work for some guys that's not the case for me um you know i don't i feel like that's a little uh i don't know what, how to articulate this i feel like that's a bit of a stretch to find some motivation sure. for me but um but yeah i mean it's it's crazy you know, when you talk to guys and you learn from different guys, how, you know, there's little things that certain guys will cling on to that, yep. that helps push them. And so I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if that were the case for some players, but it, but it's not for me. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, I, I guess, you know, just guys that have gotten drafted. I mean, and it's just constantly brought up. Uh, I feel like, you know, when a guy does make their debut or they do end up becoming a pretty prominent sport, you know, star and they weren't a top 10 pick. And it's like, where was this right. guy taken? Or why was Mike Trout passed on by 24 teams? You know, they always bring that kind of right. stuff up. So I was just more than just curious about that, you know, cause like you said, a lot yeah. of guys are like, I was third round. Are you kidding me? Like that's way too <laughs> low. You know, like you said, you expect yeah. to be higher, but you know, just things unfold differently. So um, it's interesting to hear that for sure. But mm -hmm. um, so you get drafted, you're a professional baseball player. You get two, a year and a half, two years under your belt, and yeah. then the UCL tears. Yeah. What, you know, I've never dealt with this. Jared has gone through Tommy John surgery and rehab. So what was that like for you, finding that out, you know, getting the news broken to you that you're going to be on the shelf for eight to 12 months, 
you know, right. to be able to contribute. How does that news hit you when you first hear it's a UCL? Um, you know, it was, it was weird because the, um, when I went and got pictures taken, it wasn't, it wasn't too conclusive. Although to be fair, most are not, it's hard to, it's really hard to read UCL MRI, especially pictures. Cause everyone's going to be beat up to some extent. Sure. Um, so, you know, it was kind of interesting at first. It wasn't like clear cut. Hey, you need surgery. Um, and it just kind of, it kind of was a scenario where it's like, all right, let's try and test it. And after a little bit of rest and I did, and it just, just simply didn't work. And, uh, you know, I, I, I do remember having that moment. Um, you know, I went to uh, Florida to rehab a little bit before surgery. So I, you know, they, they shut me down. I rest a little bit. We try to rehab it a little bit and start throwing again. Sure. And I do remember trying to throw, um, with some intent one day and, and just being like, yeah, this, like, no, it, it wasn't even a doctor or anyone. It was just me throwing, being like, I know this doesn't work. So we're going to have to do this. And, and yeah, it was, it, it's incredibly, incredibly frustrating. And, you know, someone who is, you know, tries to, you know, who goes into the mindset of, oh, I'm going to be in the big leagues instantly. Uh, you know, all of a sudden you're in, you're immediately like, okay, well now I'm already set back a year further than I want to be. And, that, and it, you know, it's a whole, it just tests you in a whole, a whole different way that you're not used to. Yeah, that's what, I mean, and like I said, Jared's gone through it too, but you know, for those listeners that don't know, it's not just a, you know, a surgery where, you know, you get it and then you're back, you know, using that arm even in months or two, two, three months later. I mean, you're stuck with the robotic, you know, con contraption on your arm. You got to yeah. limit your mobility. It's, yeah. it's really frustrating, you know, and luckily I've yeah. never been through it, but Jared has and. I just see guys that I've been close with, including Jared, you know, they've guys go through it and it's like, I just, I would be miserable in that situation. And it's not to, you know, pour salt into the wound, but it's just like, it, it can be, you know, it can derail careers for a lot of people. Um, but luckily, obviously modern medicine is allowed for, for guys to bounce back pretty quickly. So, um, yeah, you're, you're so, you're so far away. I think, I think for me, I think that moment right after I had surgery and I realized how far away I was from being able to like, truly throw a baseball hard again right like that was probably actually one of the worst moments and like then you, you kind of get to work and like i think i had it yeah. when i was 19 years old so i was kind of this i was just ready to get grinding i really wanted to keep playing baseball so and obviously you had been drafted you're like okay like there's no other option it's time to go through this no matter what so right I, I, I remember i remember that feeling i don't know what your feeling was like but i remember it feeling like an ice pick like directly in my elbow yeah, like, was there like a was yeah. it a one pitch thing or was it a over no. a, over a game or? No, mine was mine was absolutely a chronic one. It's it's interesting how it, how different everyone's experience was. So you you got the ice pick, you got a pretty sharp. It, it pretty started sharp it started really thickness. slow. It started slow where there was that little twinge in the elbow. You could feel warming up after the start, and then it just yeah. progressively went to the part where I I tried to th like throw through it, and I spiked a fastball. You know. Yeah, into the dirt, yeah. you know, ten feet in front yeah. of the catcher, and I was like, "That was a nice pick." Yeah, so it's, yeah, it's, it's crazy. Everyone's different. I I never had, you know, I don't know if this is good or bad, but I never had any of that that sharp pain or any of that pain before my TJ. It just it, my arm just stopped working. It just simply stopped working, and and I don't know if I don't know if you know maybe if it did hurt a lot, maybe it would have made the experience better in the sense right. that I would have known what was wrong. I don't know, but but it was really frustrating. I mean, I, I remember my last game, I was in double A at the time. And I remember my last game before they finally put me on the DL of, you know, we were, it was already declining big time. And I was, I was, I just remember having a moment where I'm like, all right, I'm going into this game. I don't even, I don't care how I do. I just, I'm going to throw this ball as hard as I can to make sure that I can pitch. And I remember it being like 83, 83, 83. Right. So it, it just it just stopped working, and and I think that also is why my MRI wasn't so conclusive because UCL tears it doesn't necessarily need to be torn. Sometimes they can just lose their integrity and get stretched out so yep. much too. So you know it it was it sucks. Bottom line, it just it just sucks. Yeah, yeah. So so I mean, some of these questions we have down here are starting to kind of answer themselves, but you know, so I feel like I kind of already have an answer to this one, but. 
But for a lot of guys, um, and you mentioned, you know, you want to get to the big leagues as fast as possible. Everybody has an expectation. It sounds like you had a really high expectation of yourself uh, to get there quickly to try to get, you know, advance through the levels. But when you're grinding through, obviously, rehab, um, and then you come back, you know, you get back to double A, bounce the next year in 2017, double A, triple A. Is there is there ever a point? that crosses your mind where you start to question just for a lot of guys. It's like, is this, is this what I'm supposed to be doing? Is this where, is this grind too much? Is it, you know, I have teammates or peers or guys that I played with that are getting the call and I'm, I'm not, not that you're performing at a low level, but you're just, you know, it's just a lot of guys that could definitely end up being major league contributors, call it quits at 25 years old because they're like, you know, that's, that's the deadline I set for myself and I'm not there. And I'm, I'm going to move on with my life. Is there any any thoughts going into your head with that sort of, you know, is this for me or any any doubts that creep in throughout that, that minor league grind, the daily nine hour bus rides, anything like that? Hold on. Hold on. You're good. I feel like you talked for a long time. I'm so sorry. No, you're good. I, I, we're losing. I'm losing you here for a second here. I'm losing you. You're good. All right. I'm, I'm sorry. You Did you come back? Like you asked a long question, but you got to ask. Yeah. It again. No, I, I was I, just generally. Was there any any doubts that creeped in throughout whether it was rehab or going advancing through the levels, bouncing up and down nine hour bus rides? Is there mm -hmm. any thoughts that come in? Like I said, a lot of guys, they set a deadline for themselves. I need to be in the big leagues at 25 or this isn't for me. You know, is there anything like right. that for you? Is there any fallback plan? Is there stuff that creeped in that was like, you know, I'm really tired of sitting on this hot ass bus and riding this thing up and down the coast. And is there anything like that that creeped in or was it just grind, grind, grind until I get there? Um, I, I definitely I definitely had some doubts there for a minute in terms of um, in terms of, you know, if I was going to be able to get you know kind of get my level of performance back that took me a really really long time um you know i i felt like i feel like i physically was a, i was able to get back on the field really quickly and i was able to kind of get to let's say 90 percent of sure. the pitcher i was before surgery like really fast um i think i actually had my first start in you know, under the one year mark, which was great. That is great. But yeah. It took me a really, it took me a really long time to kind of get that last five, ten percent, that little last edge to it. it. Took me a really long time, and and I remember twenty, you know, twenty seventeen season. That was my first full season. Yep. Post TJ, I was ha I was struggling. I really was. I was having a hard time, and it, and I never had any of those doubts where you know, Oh, it's not for me, this, that, and the other, like, I, I'm, I'm too much of a competitor, I think where, you know, I would want to ever give that up or, or not think I could do it. But, but there were doubts in the sense of like, am I just not, am I just never going to be as good as I was because of sure. this? And, and, and it, and it took, it took me a, a really long time uh, to kind of regain my form. Yeah. No, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting, you know, and it's just a lot of guys, some guys will do it for until they're 38 years old, they'll play in the minor leagues and they'll stick with it. But like, you know, it sounds like you're a guy where maybe there was a, you know, an age where you're like, I'm in double a, I'm, I'm 30 years old. I can't, you know, I just physically can't do it anymore. I can't afford it. A lot of guys. Right. I mean, they just financially, it's just tough, it's, you know, it's almost every time it's money. It's almost every time it's money. It's, right. It's. I've, I've, it's rarely, it's rarely, uh, cause they don't want to play anymore. It's usually cause it's like, man, I gotta, I gotta get on with my life. You know, I yep. can't get you, 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 when you're in the minor leagues, if you're, unless you're, you know, a million dollar, two million, three Sign million bonus, dollar yeah. bonus guy, um, you're digging yourself a hole financially until you make it. You really are. You're digging yourself a hole. You're dependent on your parents. Most of the guys, you're, you're pinching pin, you're, pinching pennies and yeah. all the craziest of places. Um, yeah, no, it, there's absolutely the breaking point for most guys, at least from my experience seems to be the vibe is like, I just can't do this anymore. This is not, and it's not because they don't want to play. It's because they can't afford to play anymore. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. Yeah. Um, definitely makes sense. So you grind through, right? I mean, you, you spend, um, you know, now it's going to be 2017. 
four, you know, three or four healthy years uh, in the minors. 2018, you know, you get up to AAA and you pitch at an okay level. Is there thoughts Mm -hmm. once you get up to that AAA level, right? You're obviously dealing with a lot of pro guys, big league guys, whether it's rehab or guys that are just bouncing back and forth. Is there right. is there that glimpse of hope on the on the flip side that's like I am so close I just need to do X better or this more and I'll be there or is there still like just keep your head down keep grinding and that call will come at some point? Um, no, yeah, I, I was I felt extremely close in eighteen. You know, we touched on twenty seventeen being you know twenty seventeen was I've never had an f- athletic experience like that in my life. I just was really struggling, not performing well, um, and, you know, was trying everything I could to to turn it around. And so, you know, after 2017, I was kind of in a weird place. You know, I had the thought, like, am I just never going to be the same pitcher I was before surgery? Like, is, is that what's what's going to happen? So that off season between 2017 and 2018, I I took hardly any rest. I did a ton of weighted balls i did a bunch of different velocities i mean i just i completely sold out and went for it um and and i was i was eating a ton like i mean i just completely yeah. completely sold out and uh and it it led to me uh kind of regaining my form and and i and i absolutely lit the world on fire in 2018 yes. uh, in spring training in spring training i felt like i was the not the best pitcher we had in the <laughs> org i was i was absolutely <laughs> dominating it was awesome it was awesome and i and i started off the year red hot too and um and you know it but that came at a price uh middle at summer man i was i was hanging there's no question about it my my I was definitely a little overworked, but I felt like I had, I felt like I had no choice at that point. I had to, I had to get back uh, to a level of performance that, that I was comfortable with. And and so I, I just kind of sold out and I, I paid the price that summer and, and I saw some performance dip there middle of the year, no question about it, but, but in the long run, totally worth it because it kind of, you know, it kind of, reignited that spark in the sense of like, man, I'm right there. I'm about to be in the big leagues. And yeah. then I think it also, I think it also kind of reestablished me as a player to the org because, you know, I'm sure they were thinking the same thing I was like, this guy's just never going to be the same. He's not going to work out. It's a shame that, you know, TJ got one, but it happens to guys. Um, right. And so that was a big thing too, is setting the world on fire to start 2018 to kind of let them know like, Hey, no, like I just needed Yep. I just needed that season post surgery to get back to where I needed to be. You can like please get excited for me. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, no, that was that was a big that was a big thing and and I felt like, you know, like I said, I, I certainly paid the price for it, but uh but it was totally worth it. Yeah. Yeah. And does that does that sort of confidence or lack of confidence or is there, you know, somebody that you meet with in 2018, just going off of the experiences we we've mentioned with the people we know where, you know, it's, it's essentially after the season's over, right. In 2017, there's an exit interview basically, or that you'd speak to somebody. Is there anybody either after 2017 going into 2018 at any point that's like, just stick with it, man. Like we want you to be good because some guys, like you said, they're more than willing to just dump a guy that was, Oh, he's a 30th rounder. Who's happened to, you know, happens to be playing really well. And then he gets up to double a and he can't hit anymore or he can't throw. That's, you know, what we expected. We'll just dump him because it doesn't cost us anything. But for you, was right. there, was there anybody that you, you know, whether it's a teammate or coach or executive or agent or anything, that's like, you're right there. I know you're right there. We want you to get there. We're not losing faith yet. Is there anybody that, that kind of gave right. you that sense of hope? Um, No, not really actually. And, you know, I think that I don't know this for sure, but I, I feel like, um, you know, my coaches that, that I dealt with were, um, you know, I've been in the org for, for a number of years at this point. And so I feel like everyone kind of had a good grasp of who I was and, and I'm not the type of guy that really needed that. And I feel like that might be the reason why I never got that. Um, so, you know, and, and, with it being, you know, our team, with our team being our big league team being, they won the world series that year. So obviously that was a, that was obviously all the attention in the org was really 
going going on that because the team was so good that year and, yeah. and everyone thought yeah. that we could win it. So so I never had that, but I didn't need that. So I don't know if me not getting that was because they knew I didn't need it or if they were distracted or sure. or or maybe they didn't care. I don't know. Yeah. But, yeah. but uh but I but no, I never got that. Oh, that's I mean it's interesting too, you know, because again it's guys, some guys like I mentioned, first round guys that you know, a high school kid will get the benefit of the doubt and get bumped up every year to a higher level. I'm sure you've come across guys like that. And you're like, what the hell is this guy doing here? You know, like he's hitting 220 and he's he's 19 right. years old. Why am I on the same team as this kid? You know, but, you know, it doesn't sound like that type of stuff phase you, which is, it, you know, if you were to give advice, I'm sure that's the way you would recommend people go about it is just don't worry about other people, because as I'm sure you've dealt with, um, you know, kind of a follow up question. Was there ever a point where you know, you, you talked about the college camaraderie, everybody's on the same team right. working towards the same goal in the pros, right. in the minor leagues, from, from what we've heard and the experiences of a lot of people, nobody, th there's plenty of guys that you end up bonding with and become friends with, but there's also plenty of guys that you'll never talk to again. They don't care how well you do. They don't care how well the team does. If they're putting up individual numbers, that's all they care about. So was there anybody that, you know, you came across where you're like, man, this guy is going to be a big leaguer, but I don't want, you know, I don't want to be like him. I don't want to be the individual guy that just doesn't care about anybody else but themselves. Cause I know there's tons of guys like that, you know, throughout the minor leagues. Right. No. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's just, it's so interesting. Once you, once you factor in it being someone's career, how, it, how it changes everything. And, and rightfully so. I mean, you know, you, you don't want to be, it's going to be hard to get anywhere in the professional world if you're best friends with everybody. But, uh, right. but yeah, you know, it's, it's, I've also found it's, it changes team to team too. It's not like, you know, in college you feel like every team has that bonding, but you know, you, you, you're sharing, it's college classmates. You're going to be right. friends. Like you share so many experiences. You're probably living in the same place. You're, seeing each other every day, even out, outside of the field. Yeah. Um, so it's just, it's just different. You know, I've, I've been on teams where we've been, we've all been really close. I've been on teams where, where we haven't been close at all. And it's been a very, just come do your work type scenario. Um, hmm. But yeah, it, it's crazy how it, there's just so many more factors when it, when pro ball comes around that, that affects that, you know, I, when I was in AAA, you know, our team, our team got along really, really well, but it was because, you know, our, everyone was suffering the same amount yeah. because our big league team was so good. Right. 17, 18, 19, our triple A team was amazing. Our triple A team was a big league team when I was there. We were so good. And, and you have just a, a locker room full of guys who unfortunately are in the minor leagues and don't deserve it. And I, and I feel like that kind of, you know, it's kind of a, a negative, but it, it did lead to our locker room kind of bonding in the sense that like everyone was kind of dealing with the same crap, you know, I was yep. like, man, this, this sucks. And, and, and because of that guys, players were able to relate to others when, you know, I'm trying to think of an example, like if an outfielder gets called up from the AAA team we're playing against and we're like, dude, we have four outfielders here that are way better than that guy. Yep. These guys deserve to be in the big leagues. And, and it just, and it, it, everyone is able to empathize really. In that. Sure. So, you know, there, it's crazy. There's so many different, so many different, uh, uh, factors that, that go into that. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard, I've heard, uh, I've heard a pretty common thing from like minor leaguers is that, uh, a minor, a double a guy is just a major league guy with an opportunity or like without the opportunity. So I mean, like a lot of times that you'll, you'll have, you'll have guys that have the ability that if they were to call up to produce, maybe, maybe not be a superstar, but they might be able to produce, better than somebody on another team and they might just end up sitting in double a and never getting that opportunity or that call. No. Yeah. There, I think that, um, a lot of times I definitely don't want to say, you know, the level playing double A's, you know, the big leagues, but, um, but I do think that opportunity and just the logistics and timing and of everything is absolutely an overlooked or an undervalued part of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it, it, there are, I've played with a ton of guys in the, in the coming up in the minor leagues who, if they were not on the Astros in 2017, yep. 2018, they would have been in the show two or three years earlier. 
Yep. Um, so yeah, um, yeah, it's it, it sucks, and and that's one of the things that I hate about the minor leagues. You know, I, obviously everyone talks about the pay, but I think team control is actually the the bigger issue. If yeah. you you know, if you had the freedom to to maybe get called up by another team. I wouldn't be as yeah, bad yeah. about you're not making any money. But when you combine the two where it's like you can't make any money and you have to do what and you're stuck. We, yeah, and we control you. That's when it that's when it's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah and I definitely. it's it's yeah, like you said, it's a very it's just a very fluid situation too. You know, it's so there's so many different factors and i just i bring up the the topic of maybe teammates that aren't as quite as close because we've dealt with actually another guy that we played college with he was a a free agent signee uh after his fifth year senior year and his first year in rookie and pro ball he started in rookie ball and uh, got called up to triple a more so as sort of a just a bullpen catcher than anything else but he was already older and and developed as a really good hitter but they wanted him to just get the looks up there and and get the feel of what it was like because then maybe the next year he'd end up actually contributing to that team and he told me, told us a story about, you know, he's on the bench. He's basically the third, the third string catcher uh, on the depth chart for that team specifically. And a uh, guy, I don't know, came, came up to the plate and, and drove a guy in with a sack fly, something like that. And came yeah. back into the dugout and, um, you know, he was frustrated or something happened and he came in the dugout and he gave him just a pat on the ass. Like, Hey, you know, still contributing play. And the guy turned around to him and was like, don't ever think about touching me ever again like don't touch me Uh, don't look at me don't talk to me and so i know there's guys like that you know and i'm sure that's frustrating to deal with because you're like man i we're all going for the same thing you know it's just like let's let's get a little bit on the same team here and have each other's backs you know right yeah thankfully thankfully i never had any experience that was that strong um you know i well i was also on a bunch of you know, our every minor league team I was on, we were we were winning a lot of games, and sure. guys always long a lot more when you're winning yeah. too. Yeah. So I'm sure that was a big factor. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, so we're getting through the minors here. 2019, talking about lighting the world on fire. I mean, statistically, it looks like it, it might have been you know your best full campaign, right? At the highest level, things are just trending upwards for you. Um, mm-hmm. 2019, you know, again, Astros, like you said, the big league team is just having so much success. Um, right. Is there anything where it's like, you know, obviously you're dealing with guys coming up and down too, guys that are contributing in the big league team, talking to you guys. Um, is there is there even more of a of a motivating factor to be like, I, I want to contribute to that? I'm seeing these guys on the big leagues, you know, on MLB network every day, they're winning games, they're right. doing this and even seeing guys that you play with. Is that, is that, is that really like, I feel like that's kind of that last spark where you're like, man, I, I could contribute to a world series team, you know? Right. Yeah. Uh, actually hardly, there was hardly any of that. And I think that's part of the reason why a small reason I'll be it, but it was part of the reason why I had a successful year. I feel like, I feel like I was finally, Feel like i was finally able to just kind of completely give up the word the worries about things that i really didn't control like completely like not care at all 28 you know 2018 i still had that you know 20 you know i set the world on fire in camp in the beginning of the year and i'm like all right come on i'm getting called up i'm getting called up it just doesn't come it doesn't come and you just you're like fuck you know and, um but the 2019 was i got feel like i could just didn't have any worry about that and i feel like it was my last year of my minor league contract too so i i want i don't know if that was a fact or not but it could have been in the back of my head where it was like hey if the astros don't call me up this year no big deal someone else right. finally can now so um so yeah I, I feel like just kind of giving that up was was great and i didn't have that worry in in 2019 yeah so <clears throat> going after 2019 i don't i don't mean to smile but you just get screwed with this COVID thing that comes into place. Not just you, but everybody. I mean, like every right. minor leaguer just gets hosed with this situation. You, you find that out. You find out the season's not going to happen or you don't know, or maybe the big league team will happen. You have yeah. the alternate site. So, so what was that whole experience like of like, am I going to get to the alternate site? You know, I, we obviously we're all watching and following. And I'm, as you can see, I'm, I'm a Padres guy uh, at heart being from San yeah. Diego, but you know, the, the alternate training site roster comes out for the Padres and I'm looking at 
guys that they literally had dra drafted m a month before that high school kids that right. are being put at the alternate training site. Cause that's at the end of the day, that's where those guys can end up actually getting the, the most work. But for you as a guy who's you're in triple a, you're right on the edge. Wh what was that experience like of like, you're just in complete limbo. You have no idea what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was certainly weird. And it, and it was, you know, I, I can't even really comment on how weird it was really about the COVID stuff because you know, my, the forefront of my brain was worried about my arm because I had I had torn my UCL for the yeah. second time. That was actually in January of 2020. And that, that was, was early that was the second part of that question is like you're going through rehab yeah. at the same time. So like what what right. is yeah. what is both so, of those things? Yeah. So my so my brain was just super locked into like let's try and get this arm healthy, man. Yeah. I don't want to. Yeah. You know, I don't. It, it doesn't matter if there's a COVID season or not, if I can't pitch, you know, cause I won't be sure. playing anyway. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, that was absolutely the, the number one thing in my head was, was my, my health, non COVID, my, my arm health. Sure. And then obviously sure. it's in the pandemic, yeah. it makes it, it makes it even extra weird. So, uh, but yeah, like I said, number, number one thing on my brain at that point in time was, Hey, let's try and let's try and get this arm healthy. Yeah. And that was, well, you kind of t touched both of those parts of that, but, on that specific injury, kind of just, you know, reading up on it, it, it sounded like similar, you know, elbow stuff for you. Um, but yeah. it wasn't, you didn't have to get, you know, it was again, similar, like Tommy John, maybe, maybe not describe like right. what, what exactly kind of unfolded for you. Cause it's, you know, it looks like you're going through all kinds of different therapies and possible, right. you know, injections and all these different things, trying to just maybe battle through it more than anything. But what was that injury? Like, what was it? And, and what was that kind of like, doing for yeah, you as so, a pitcher so i so i i toured the ucl um to a certain degree they they i think they classified it as a high grade meaning it's a little over 50 percent was okay. torn that one at one spot um and you know it's you know i touched on it earlier how difficult it is to read you know read what a ucl looks like on an yep. mri especially for a pitcher and, and that that becomes even more difficult on a guy who's already had Tommy John. Yep. Um, so it, it's, it's never, it's never a clear cut answer um, as to, as to how to, how to treat it, unless it's like completely flapping in the wind right. gone. Right. right. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah. And, and it, it really came down to, well, actually I, I want to say COVID was probably a small factor too. Cause it's like, all right, the season's getting delayed. I have these injections I could get that could maybe work. Maybe I can, maybe I could, you know, back my way into not missing any time somehow, which sure. would be amazing. Right? So, so I went and I got the PRP injection and yep. the stem cells. Stem injected. cells is what we saw. Yeah. 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 So they, they take a little, uh, bone marrow out of your hip, spin it around in the centrifuge, yep. take that out and shoot it right on the spot to try and see if you can't get some, some growth there to you know some scarring there to kind of close up the tear sure uh and yeah so then i just spent all the pandemic rehabbing those injections to try and get back to to pitching as quickly as i could so the rehab for you during COVID is that is that like in the garage with the plyo balls is that in like home gym is that like what, what does yeah. that look like in COVID? um no so i'm Thankfully, I live in the state of Georgia, Georgia, so we stayed pretty open. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> even, in the middle, yeah. even in the middle of 2020. Um, no, I was still able to go to the physical therapy. So okay. it did stink because I was not able to go, you know, the pandemic, obviously, I wasn't able to rehab with our trainers and, and our, you know, our staff with the Astros. Right. And I couldn't be in team facilities and whatnot. Exactly. But, but, uh, but I was able to work with PT here back home. Uh, and I didn't, I, I don't think I missed any time. I don't think at any point they had to shut down. I think I was able to go every day, which was great. That is so, great. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I was lucky. I was lucky when it came to, you know, given the circumstances, I still had, um, you know, a, a good amount of resources at my disposal. Yeah. That's, that's really, yeah. Beneficial. And I know those guys were, you know, the, like I said, alternate training sites, that's like the only spot where team team facilitated work could go on and the rest of you guys were just granted you were dealing with the injury but i'm sure you had a lot of teammates and buddies that were just 
limp they had no idea what they you know they're taking dry hacks in their living room because that's about yeah. all they could do you know yeah it's it was it was crazy man it, it was crazy Every, everyone's experience was so different and and you know it's some guys really really had to get creative yeah <laughs> with, yeah with their work yeah. they really did can't can't it's actually pretty funny how you uh you're talking about the mri post tommy john and uh mm -hmm. I actually ended up fracturing a little bone. I had a little bone growth in my elbow after, like after Tommy John. Ended mm -hmm. up fracturing it. Thought I tore it again. I remember going in to get the MRI, and the doctor just looked at me and was like, "I don't know, man." But it was like yeah. my last year. It was my last year as a senior. I was, you know, old, too old. I was like banged up. I was, uh, all of a sudden, like the the pro card that had always been this dream was out the window. And I just remember him looking at it, being like, "Dude, it just looks like a black." massive scar tissue and, <laughs> yeah and a bunch of BS, yeah. bs in there and i was like i was like all right i guess i'm just gonna try to wait it out and see if uh see if my elbow feels better in a couple no, months and no it's, yeah it's, it's true it's it's really hard you know people think that um you know granted granted they have made great advancements with treatment and in, in, in therapies and surgeries and everything but but still at the end of the day the best doctors will tell you you pitch you can pitch or you can't yeah like there's only so much yeah. this picture is going to tell me, you know, if it looks terrible and you can pitch, that's great. Yeah. Keep pitching. You know, if it looks pretty good, I don't know what's wrong, but you can't pitch, then we got to fix it. You yep. know, it's, it's yeah. at the end of the day, it's still a pretty simple, simple thing. It's like either it's either it works or it doesn't. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. We can only see, we can only see so much. So it's all up to you and how you feel. Right. So yeah. Right. 100%. Yeah. And it's definitely, uh, you know, it's also one of those things where it's like, it's, it depends on your pain tolerance. I feel like in a lot of ways, you know, like you could just keep getting cortisone shot five shots a year and just pitch with it. But at the end of the day, the doctor's going to tell you, you know, like what, what we, what you choose to do as a profession and what we chose to do, you know, all of us growing up, throwing a baseball is just such an unnatural human motion. It's just so horrible for your body when it comes down to it, but right. you can either do it or you can't. So yeah, right. it's uh it's interesting to hear just the inside perspective, you know, from from dealing with that COVID stuff. And then, right. you know, you go through COVID, you deal with the suspension, but you make the most of it with, you know, your time down in the Dominican. Right. So we see the footage of the Dominican League. We see what it's like. We see the the energy these guys play with, obviously it's probably a little bit different with maybe the crowds or stuff like that in the Dominican, but I, we don't know. What what yeah. was the experience like as an American, you know, borderline big leaguer going down to the Dominican right. and dealing with those guys? Obviously, number one, language barrier. But besides that, right. what was that experience like for you? Yeah, no, it was it was uh, it was interesting because, you know, all of the you know, you hear about the fans and how crazy the games are. Not, we didn't get that because yeah. the stadiums were empty the season I was there. Right. So, and, and I didn't have that experience during the regular season of empty stadiums. So right. my, I remember the first week of games, like it felt like eerie. It was like really weird. Like the games are about to start and it's like empty. really quiet. Like, yeah. like, like it, it's just yeah. it's like oh yeah it's kind, of, it's kind of cringy almost yeah um but but it but it, i'll tell you what with the pandemic i think that was the most competitive that leagues um maybe ever been because everyone wanted to get reps in no one got a full season and so all you know a lot of really really great players wanted to play who under normal circumstances probably wouldn't have played so it led to some some really great baseball no question about it and and like you said, the language bar barrier, the, the tough things with, with Dominican guys is, you know, I could recognize Spanish pretty well, but they, they're another level. They're oh, yeah. faster they're, and there's a lot of yeah. slang. So, so yeah, it, it definitely a language barrier too. Yeah, no, it's, it's interesting. Like I said, I mean, we, you know, I'm sure you probably came across kids that were, you know, 17 years old, you know, but those guys, they just got signed or, you know, there's just, there was such a crazy time uh, to be a baseball player that nobody really knew what was going on in the background or going down the Dominican league or going to, you know, internationally anywhere and just going to play somewhere else to get reps in. Cause at the end of the day, baseball is, is a repetition sport and you need it. You can't just be sitting on your ass doing nothing for eight months. You have to stay locked in, especially a guy like you who was on the cusp. Um, yeah. so yeah, it's really interesting to, to hear that, but then, you know, you go through that, that crazy year and then 
2021 comes around and obviously Mm -hmm. big year for you, but going into that year, you're, you're right on the back end of being able to play again. And you know, the expectation for you going into that year, is this the year where you're saying in, in your head, this is my big league year. This is the year where I need to be, not need to be right, but this is the year I expect right. to be contributing to the team. Right. Yeah. Um, no, hundred percent. I was kind of, um, I was kind of at the point where, you know, so I had maybe 18 games left on a suspension. Yep. I don't remember the exact number. I think it was 18 games, but I was at that point where, you know, I was like, if I don't get called up the instant, this ends like, <laughs> what are they doing? Yeah. You know, it was, yeah. it, you know, I felt like I got snubbed at the end of 2019 and, and certainly would have been called up in 2020 if everything was normal. Yep. Um, so, you know, I felt like I was long overdue and, you know, I, I try, I think the, I think there's no better example of it than uh, me having my, my bags packed before, <laughs> before I got the call, I had packed my suitcase that day. Really? Because, uh, yeah. I had, I had all my stuff packed up. Uh, ready to go um, that day that my suspension ended. So as soon as the Astros game ended and my suspension was lifted, you know, I was, I would be ready to go. And thankfully, thankfully that, that did happen. Yeah. So. Yeah. So that's, that's transitioning right to to the big leagues for you. And before we actually get into the, the craziness that was, you know, the year you had, you get the call, right? Mm-hmm. Everybody's got the story of the call the news breaking yeah. how did the news break to you where were you and yeah. you know who was the first call you know you make when you get that call yeah. right is the mom yeah, yeah. is it who, who right. who's the first call <laughs> right yeah so i'm this i'm really gonna let you guys down here because because my no, like i said right. the uh like i said i i had i'd like felt like it was long overdue i was pretty numb to it like and i was expecting it like there was all these factors where like when i when i got the call there's like there was n- hardly any of that like overwhelming emotion right. that you would expect right. yeah. um but yeah like, triple a manager i was at the alternate site um and i was in my hotel room um and like i said this the Oops, suspension sorry. ended once the astros game ended so i we had to wait for that game to end yeah, um, go ahead. So we had we had to wait for the Astros game then for my suspension to be officially lifted and that I could actually officially get the call. So the so I was playing Xbox, I was playing uh, uh Call of Duty and I had like my I had the Astros game like on my phone on the like right under the TV so I could kind of like check in. Sure. You know, as I'm playing and and so I saw the game ended and I'm like, okay, hopefully, you know, hopefully the phone rings here soon. I don't know. So I ended up playing and we ended up uh I'm in war zone with some of my buddies back home. We have to <laughs> drop into I'm, dance. I'm not, I'm terrible at video games. I need to preface this. So it's going to make it sound like I'm some kind of gamer and I'm really not. I'm terrible. However, we were in a really, like, we were in a really good game. We're on, we are on, we're going to win this final thing. two like, teams. Great spot. Final two huh? teams. Final two teams. Yeah, no, last we're, circle. We're in, a great, we're in a great spot. So I'm like, it's doing a nice job distracting me because I'm yeah. like, oh, we're in this thing. And, Hearts and racing. sure enough, we get we get down to the last three teams, and then my phone starts ringing, and uh, I'm like, and I and I saw Mickey Story pop, or the AAA manager, his name pop up, so I knew what it was, and I was like, I, you know, I'm, I'm talking to the guys on that side, I'm like, I'm sorry, this is terrible timing, <laughs> but I got to go, <laughs> so I answered the phone, and, and uh, they did, they ended up not winning, but um, but yeah, I answered the phone and. He tells me I'm going up. I was like, awesome, like, sweet, hang up. I get back on the headset. I'm like, I got to make some phone calls, guys. Sorry, I'm yeah. heading up the show. They're like, oh, congrats, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So actually, they, so actually, a couple of my friends knew via Xbox uh, communication before even my parents did. But, <laughs> but, uh, but once, once, that, uh, once I hopped off, my first phone call was to my parents. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Sorry. Yeah, as, as, soon as, you got off the, as soon as you got off the game, the guys are – M- mf and you about uh we could have got that dub if he just wasn't so selfish yeah. to go to the show <laughs> no, so the timing was terrible. <laughs> no that's that's a great the armor box too yeah that's a great yeah. story that's a great that's great to hear so you call parents yeah. right parents but you, there sounds like they're on the same page as you as like they're expecting it right you guys probably knew 
but was they, there still they were way more emotional than, than right no that's what we figured yeah, yeah. so then yeah. after you after you get that call right again before this happens and this is a lot of stuff people obviously overlook yeah is there you know you got to get tickets for mom and dad you got to get right. tickets for for potentially if we don't know girlfriend wife friends anything how how did that like non-baseball off the field situation unfold where you're like are you talking to the astros ticket office or are they calling you saying we have 20 yeah. tickets set aside like how does that work for for a first time no. call up yeah no so so there's a um there's like a little system players use um and you have like a little login and you can reserve tickets um this that and the other so it, and and they have that during major league spring training too okay. so i didn't really have to do i didn't have to do anything i was already set up i literally just had to log in and reserve you know i i, I reserved um I, my parents came my sister and brother-in-law came and then four of my friends from back home came so i just reserved them tickets you know that as soon as as soon as i got word that the they were all coming are those are those field level or do they have to throw them in the upper deck or what are they uh no no it's sweet. At, at least I don't know if it's like this for every team, but I know at the Astros we would usually have two options. There's field level, and then there's cheap, yeah. cheaper tickets. And and uh, no, I, for that obviously I, yeah. I threw them all. I got the best seats I could. I yeah. could get them. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. So so obviously like a lot of stuffs unfolding. You get on a plane, right? I'm guessing, or you were already close by. Where was the Astros alternate site? Where was that in in relation to yeah. Minute Maid? So it was in it was in uh, Corpus. So okay. I just yeah. drove. I literally just had to drive over. It's about mm, three and three hours and some change. Okay. You know, not not a just just long enough where you you want to stand up, but but yeah. not terrible. Yeah, not, not terrible. So what's what's uh, what's going on in the car? Is it a podcast you're listening to? Do you got music going? Like, are you hyping yourself up? Are you trying to calm yourself down? Like, what's the thought process on the uh, way to the park? You know what? That's a good question, and I, I really don't remember. I feel like I feel like I used the car ride, uh, the time in the car to make a lot of the, a lot of my phone calls sure. to let people know. Yeah, I, if I remember correctly, I was on the phone for for most of it. But yeah, I, I don't I don't really remember. I wish I could go back and be, I'd be curious to see what I chose to listen to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I just you know it's it's interesting. And then you know again more stuff that they don't think about. But like you know you get the call are they, are they going, you know, Hey, here's your hotel room key or here's your, here's the t you know, the condo for guys that bounce back and forth. Like, how does that process work for, you got your, all your stuff, right? You got your suitcases at close. Right. You don't know. I mean, you're hoping you're obviously there for as long as possible. You know, is it like, should I go to the store and start buying furniture? Like what, you know, what's right. the, what's the mindset for that, that, you know, day or two or that leading up to it? Right. Yeah. It's, it is the logistics of living in pro ball is, is a nightmare. Yeah. You're right. There's a, there's a lot of, a lot of things, but um, for the first call up, I, I think we had, I think we had, so when you get called up the first time you get seven days in the hotel, Gotcha. you can use seven days. So, um, and when I got called up, I think we had maybe four games left four, three, four, maybe five games left in the homestand sure. we were hitting the road. So I just stayed in the hotel. Um, until then and then well when we went on the road trip i actually um reserved an airbnb for myself um um for the next homestand and then okay. i used that time when i think that next homestand was like a week and i used that time to find like a permanent living sure uh, situation which which was uh a, not as difficult as normal because our triple a team was had moved to sugarland which is a yeah. suburb of Houston. Yeah. so i was able to room with guys um who weren't sure if they were going to be in the big leagues or triple a thankfully when the triple a team's that close you don't have to worry if you're on the shuttle going sure. up and down because you're gonna you can live in the same area either way so so it was great yeah so i just i had the one week where i had to get myself an airbnb um and i used that time to to lock down the, you know, the apartment I ended up getting for the season. Yeah. 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 It's interesting to hear that stuff too. Cause it's the stuff you don't think about, you know, it's the logistical side off the field. That's like, 
it's it's just super important you know living arrangements yeah. super, you don't want to be shacked yeah. up in some motel six you know like you gotta and i know they have a lot of guys that are full-time employees for the, the club to to handle that stuff but it's it's stuff that you don't hear about you know on on tv so so you get the call you're in houston you're ready to go what what's the process like showing up to the yard first day welcome to the big leagues walking in the clubhouse kind of walk us through like how that first experience is walking in whether the guys are in there or not i mean you know you see it in movies yeah. the rookie you know 30 38 year old jim morris walks in and he sees all these wade boggs jerseys and all these guys that aren't right. in there what was that experience like for you walking in that first time you know it wasn't um it wasn't anything that that stood out to me i think part of that is one i was in the org for a very long time so i had already I knew pretty much everyone already. I didn't have to meet anyone. Um, sure. You know, a lot of the a lot of the big leaguers were either the draft class before me or my class or maybe even the class after me. We came up together and I and we just kind of got separated after Tommy John. So, um, so I you know I was very familiar with all the guys. They were very familiar with me. Um, same goes for the staff. So it was it was it's just a day of, day of work, man. It was it was pretty. Uh, it was probably. I, I don't know. I feel like my uh, call up and my experience with it was probably as quote unquote normal as as probably anyone's could be. I didn't really have any of those, you know, uh, Jim Morris moments, yeah. so to speak. Yeah. No. Yeah. It's it's uh, you, you never know. I mean, um, and also, I mean, I know you're dealing with guys, you know, I think, uh, you know, you have like a guy like Maldonado's catching or you got Jason Castro obviously was catching for you in that game. But, mm -hmm. you know, is there is there anything where you have to spend that first day um, like with a guy or with the pitching coach? Like, hey, if I, you know, just so happen to come in with one out in the first inning, uh, right. what 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 is you know, what's what's your go to? What's this and that? Or is it already pretty yeah. much covered? No, that's, that's, you know, I'm, I'll be, I'm very interested to see how this side of things works with the Phillies. Cause I've, I've only known the Astros as right. a player. Um, but the Astros, I can't imagine anyone being much more, you know, much better, much more thorough than they are with, with all that. They've certainly been one of the front runners with all the saber metric stuff. So, you know, all of that stuff that's already covered and it doesn't matter if you're, a first year guy or if you know or if it's your 15th year yeah you're gonna have you're gonna have those meetings to to try and cover all of that yeah so you go through you got the spikes on you know you grab the glove the hoodie and you make the walk to the bullpen mm -hmm. obviously obviously mentally preparing for that that game you know that there's a possibility that you're going to come in at some point. Mm -hmm. Did it ever cross your mind that a you'd be throwing more than one inning or B <laughs> that you'd be coming in any time before the fifth or sixth inning Did that ever cross yeah. your mind? Yeah. Um, I definitely, I definitely um, was not surprised to throw more. So I was actually stretched out as a starter. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Just at that point. So yeah, and I, I knew I was gonna um, be a candidate to to log innings. So so the you know throwing more than one inning certainly was nothing that surprised me. But yeah, you're never you're never going into the bullpen expecting to go into the game. You know. Yeah in the first inning like yeah. it happened and, and and even if you do usually things are unfolding in the game for so like you see it going bad unraveling for a yep. long time where you're able to kind of ramp yourself up but yeah you never expect to suddenly be thrust in there uh you know early on like that yeah because you know i don't know if you are you a coffee guy when you go out to the bull i mean like you said you're a starter uh, yeah so you're yeah i'm a coffee guy okay so you're you're a starter though and so you obviously have a different way of preparing, right? You have, you're probably more used to the long toss and, and having, you know, an hour plus to prepare for the game. Obviously right. it's a different transition to the, to the bullpen. So even like you said, you start to see things unravel and it's a worst case scenario and it's seven, nothing when you come in and you know, now this is my job to eat innings. You, you also know that coming in, but 
What's going through your mind when you you're getting your warm up pitches? So just for reference for everybody listening, Kent came into the game with a one out in the first inning of his major yeah. of the first game he was basically going to be playing for the Astros. Uh, Odorizzi started, faced one batter, um, had you know something tweaking somewhere in his body, arm, and <clears throat> decided training staff decided that he couldn't continue. So you're told, hey, you're coming in. Mm-hmm. What's the difference for you? <laughs> Obviously, you've warmed up in the bullpen and you've you've had experience getting loose in a bullpen scenario. Having right. to get yourself loose on the field, right on the pitcher's mound in front of the yeah. thousands and thousands of people. You've experienced right. pitching in front of crowds before, but I know, you know, personally, and Jared knows too, we've both been in those situations. You get as much time as you need, but it still doesn't feel really like don't. it doesn't you do, but you don't exactly. Yeah. It doesn't feel like yeah. nearly. Cause if I had as much time as I needed, yeah. I'd be out there for half an hour getting loose. If it was up to me, yeah. you know, yeah. I'd, have, yeah. I'd, I'd get a foam roller on the mound. Yeah. Start rolling the back out, right. get some band work in right in front of everybody, but it's not, it's really right. not. It's like, there's definitely, especially this being your first time out there on a big league mound, making your debut. There's probably a little bit of a heightened sense of like, everything kind of feels a little bit quicker maybe yeah. maybe not for you but just by some of the answers you no, said today you're just a no, you're a hard listen. competitor but I, I could imagine how i would be in a situation like that and uh, my, my yeah. heart would be beating fast so no li- listen to me listen to me listen to me i i've <laughs> i've really i've really uh understated this in the past when i've had when i've answered this question for people no it was absolutely terrible brutal yeah. Yeah. i would never want to do that ever and especially you know i'm I'm playing hurt at this point. Like I've been hanging for the, like, I'm playing with a half of a UCL. So like when I warm up, like at that point in my life, my warm ups were extremely long, extremely thorough. Yep. Like I had to get my body feeling perfect just so my arm wouldn't hurt as bad as it usually does. Right. You know what I mean? So, so yeah, going out there on that, I was absolutely terrible. I was dreading it. I didn't want to do it. And I wish that I could have brought foam rollers out there. And all that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I, I remember I did take, I did take my time to an extent and I, and I was complimented by a lot of staff and players when they're like, Hey, like, good job. Like keeping your head on straight and taking yeah. your time out there. And, all that. and in the back of my head, I'm like, dude, I did not take my time. Yeah. That was like, heard of the time that i wanted to yeah. take <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah no it was terrible so yeah so i i i look at it as the debut like extra energy that it injects into you uh balanced balanced me not getting my normal warm-up in so it so it evened out it evened out yeah no no it's, yeah, that, it's... that was a uh... yeah that was a, that was a question yeah that we had that we had written down for you here it was like obviously you couldn't feel prepared for the specific moment but like you had to have just been riding a bit of a, an adrenaline high just that i couldn't even imagine you know like you're you're this is your first day on the job really and, right and you're getting thrown you're getting thrown into right. the captain's chair to steer the yeah. ship for the team yeah so no, it's you know once i passed that that warm-up and we got rolling though i'm i'm glad it worked out the way it did i'm 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 very comfortable you know it's you feels like a start at that point once right. you get past the the warm up and and that's what I've been pretty much my whole life so I was very comfortable with that and I and I'm I'm happy it worked out the, the way it did and thankfully uh Odorizzi ended up being okay too so yeah. so no, uh, no casualties were a part <laughs> of, of my debut either which yeah. is huge <laughs> yeah so so you know we could talk we could sit here and talk about how much you were prepared or weren't prepared and maybe maybe your answer was I was completely locked in I only needed 10 pitches right to get ready which is usually not the case whether you're as prepared as anybody or not you get on the mound and the first guy you have to deal with is superstar at the time well i guess he kind of turned himself into it but otani's at the plate and do you have you know is sink or down and in is going to be where i'm going to start with this guy am i going to start him with the breaking ball am i going to you know yeah. is there like you're just you know it's obviously approaches as a pitcher depend on situational timing of the game and everything else but you're fresh and the first guy you get is otani does yeah. that does that hit you at all like oh shit like this 
like it's not like you're you you got the the pitcher spot in the in the National League or you got a, right. you know a, a 230 hitter like you got this guy who could take me deep with probably anything right. I throw and I'm just going to try my best or is it like I'm going after him like what's the thought process when you see Otani uh, step in No yeah you you're going after the guy you have to right. I'm just you know I I I'm not uh, talented enough to not have that mentality. Yeah. Uh, so, um, no, yeah, going after him, no question. There, there wasn't really any, you know, and and him being a lefty too. I'm like, oh, sweet, I get a, you know. Yeah. It actually was kind of a. It actually was honestly, even though it's you know the eventual MVP, me being the type of pitch I am, I'm like, oh, I get a lefty to start. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean? So. Yeah. 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 No, you just go after him. Yeah. No. So you you. Uh... Again, for those of you who don't know, uh, he makes his debut with one out, gets Otani in his first at bat, or his first batter he ever faces. Obviously, you end up finishing the game, which is just bananas, like just crazy, um, and an incredible job. At, you know, obviously first at, first outing too just emphasizes it even more. But are you thinking, you know, going through the lineup, looking at it that day? you obviously have guys that you probably want to worry about, like we said, more than others, right? You have Otani's, you have the Uptons, the Pujols's, yes. um, you know, and this is not a knock on anybody else, but you have, you know, like a guy like Kurt Suzuki where you're like, well, you know, if I leave something over the plate, there's a better chance he doesn't hurt me here than the rest of the guys. Right. Is there is there a guy, you know, if anything, if there's a, you know, it's a tough question to ask, but is there any silver lining to being like, you know, I gave up two home runs, but those are the only runs I gave up. And the guys that took me deep were Otani and Albert Pujols of all people, right. you know, is there anything yeah. where you're like, yeah. you're like, man, if anybody's going to take me deep, I'm glad it was those guys. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. The close, the closest, uh, you know, we talked about that, like rookie moment, the Jim Morris moment, the closest thing I had to a Jim Morris moment would have been after the game, you know, my buddy, uh, Brian, who's a big baseball guy was, was there. And, and, you know, we're talking about how like, yeah, Pujols was my first homer. And I'm like, yeah, P you know, Albert Pujols was, you know, on my fantasy baseball team yeah. in high school. Or yeah. whatever. So, so yeah. like, yeah. So yeah, that, that was a, that was a small little moment. And yes, nothing, nothing against the rest of the angels lineup, but yeah, if I had to pick someone uh, on that team that day to be my first home run, it would absolutely be Pujols. Albert Pujols, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. it's just crazy. I mean, it's just it's crazy to, like yeah. you said. I mean, it's it's uh, you know you're up there to compete, but you can't help in a lot of ways. You hear guys talk about getting called up and playing against guys that they're like, man, I I was playing with this guy in video games in high school, and right. you know, and now yeah. I'm trying to get him out. Like it's, or I'm trying yeah. to hit off of this guy. It's just, it seems to me right. like it'd be a sort of a surreal experience. But at the same time, right? I mean, you're definitely locked in trying to do your job essentially as a pitcher to get guys out. Right. Yeah. No. And and you know, it's it's funny during that game, like both home runs were just were just awful pitches too. The, the Pujols <laughs> home run was like Did it change up was out it of, right out. Of, Right, change up yeah. right, that, right down Main Street. I mean, it was like right, right out of the hand. Yeah, I'm like, crap. You know what yeah. I mean? Right, right out of the hand. You know, and he, and he capitalized. He, he. I think yeah. it was the hardest ball. I think it was the hardest hit ball I've given up. I gave up all year, actually. I think was that Pujols home run. Was it? Change up. I yeah. Well, I think so. I mean, yeah, like we said, it's Albert Pujols, and towards this later part of his career, he's just absolutely mashed left-handed pitching. So it's like you can't. It's just really like it, you know, like we said, just tip your cap. It's Albert Pujols. He's he has six hundred right. plus of these home runs. Like, right. give me a break, you know. Um, yeah. I was so I remember being so like I I don't want to say well, pissed off is probably the wrong word, but just so like just uber competitive that. I was. I made sure, like, I was like, I'm gonna throw him so many changeups the rest of the game because he took me deep on a changeup. I gotta make sure that you can get him out with the changeup. Yeah, everyone yeah. knows that my changeup is better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, that's a good way to look at it. No, it's yeah. It's and it's all about. I mean, you you, you limited the damage, right? Obviously. I mean, um, so you finished the game eight and two thirds. Um, the two runs. Is there? Uh, you know, do you have that first strikeout ball anywhere? Did they obviously, I think it ended the inning, one of your innings. Uh, did, did they yeah, flip um, it to you or did they give it to you after the they game? Gave, they gave me, they gave me like, like 10 different baseballs. Really? From the game. Yeah. So, um, and it worked out perfect where um, I was able to give, I, everyone who came to, 
came to my debut, I, I gave him ball. It worked out pretty well. I kept the I kept one of them, and I it was my first pitch. I kept my first pitch in okay. the big leagues. I have it in a little case. Nice. Um, I gave. I'm trying to remember who I gave what. I think I gave my mom my first strikeout. I think I gave my dad the the game winning pitch. The you know the last strikeout of the game. Sure. Um. Uh, I don't remember the other. Some of them I didn't. I didn't even know what they were. Like they were just game balls that they sure stored away. And they like so. What what they do is they have the authenticator guy, right? And, yeah, they do that. And so there's like a little barcode so you can scan and see what the play was. And so I gave those to my friends that came. So that was like kind of like lottery. Like I don't know what these are, guys. Yeah. So, you know, don't yeah. get mad at me. I think one of them was one of them was like a ground out. I think one was a foul ball. Yeah. So like there's. A bunch of different ones. Nice. Yeah. That's, that's, I've always been curious about kind of where those balls, I know they always show, sorry, I'm all blurred out on the camera, but they always show, um, those balls getting flipped to the dugout and then you see some guy slap right. a sticker on it and you're like, what, what is that? Right. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. But, anyways, yeah. So, um, on the topic of obviously being on the team, Jared had this question about, um, like potentially guys that made an impact, but Jared, you can go ahead. Yeah, I was just wondering, like, kind of coming up through through the minor leagues. Obviously, you're meeting a lot of these people that you've seen on TV or heard of, and I was just wondering, like, if you had one guy specifically that you met while you were in the minor leagues or in spring training or just at the facilities that you were like that was already in the big leagues, established, that just had such good, like good energy, and you just just stands out out of all those guys that were in the bigs. Because okay. obviously, you're gonna have those guys that are gonna keep it to themselves, you know. And then, right, so right, who's, right. who's the guy so that you got- met that was this? a big energy guy uh george springer george springer oh yeah certainly yeah he 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 had a uh, he had great energy all the time he was like our team's like designated dj you know he'd bring he'd bring the big speaker to the hot tub and blast tunes like yeah george springer was was definitely one of those uh those energy guys that that you talk about sorry i'm trying to get my camera that's focused over here yeah. but yeah that's cool to hear there we go um what uh you know when the guys come together on the mound like that what what do you hear from the pitching coach when is it just a you know they all stand around the bullpen or they stand around the mound when you're throwing right we've all had it we warm it up whether it's between innings or anything like that you yeah. got you got Carlos Correa and you got Alex Bregman you got these guys. Is there anything that they said, pitching coach, anything just like, hey, go get them? Or is it like, hey, keep this away from Otani? Is it anything like that or just like let let him do his business? No, it was nothing like that. And, you know, I don't know how that normally is. But, you know, I like I said throughout this, like me being an older guy, me being a guy who felt like I belonged there years prior and playing with a lot of these guys already, I feel like, we have already kind of established a certain level of trust with one another where I, I feel like no one really felt the need to say anything. It was just, yeah, you know, we were just playing some baseball. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's interesting. Um, and then on, on that, you know, on the full season of the Astros, um, you obviously contribute to the team at some point and it makes you eligible uh, for a ring at the end of the year. Is that, mm-hmm. is that, are you, are you, I mean, obviously you hope the Astros do well, but right. does that ever cross your mind? Like, oh shit, like these guys are obviously in the World Series. Like, am I, it, right. are, are they going to, is it going to get shipped to you? Like, are, are those thoughts going through your head at all? Like, hey, I played on, I played with these guys. Uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a part of this team and, and they're about to win the World Series, you know, like, is that, yeah. is that going through your head? Um, Not really. Um, I, Obviously I want them to win, like, I'm, hoping the Astros win the world series, you know, it's part of the team. Um, You know, I feel like if my season wouldn't have wasn't uh, as short as it was, it'd be different. But given that, you know, I hadn't been playing with them. My last game was, I think the end of May. And so it had been a number of months where I hadn't been with the team playing with them. So, you know, I don't want to say I feel like I wouldn't deserve the ring, but I, I don't feel like I would have been, you know, I just wasn't as big a part of it as I would have wanted sure. to be, you know? So, so that, that thought really didn't cross my mind a whole lot. Yeah. It's, I mean, I know there's some guys that just, 
they pitch one inning and they get the ring, you know? So, I mean, it probably would have been cool yeah. to get in the mail or something and been like, I I'm a world <laughs> champion, I guess, you know, but yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. And then, you know, you mentioned the season gets cut short, you know, another unfortunate sort of situation, but it's part of it. Um, you get an injury that shuts down the season, obviously you're rehabbing and then you get claimed on waivers. Yeah. What is that process like for a player? Like, how do you find that out? And what is that like for a guy like, Hey, you're not with us anymore. You're going to the Phillies. Like, how does that unfold right. for you as a, as a player? Uh, I mean, you know, the, you know, the scene in, uh, in a uh, money ball where Brad Pitt's trying to explain like, Hey, like he's like trying to get him to practice firing yeah. someone. Yeah. And he's like, no, these are professional ball players. You just, and then he shows him, he's like, Hey, you've been traded, blah, blah, blah. And the yeah. guy just looks angry. All right. Okay. That's pretty much how it was. I got a phone call uh, and they're like, Hey, let you know, you, you're now on the Phillies. And that was, and I was like, all right. So <laughs> that's then, pretty much it. No, that's, do you that's get, it. A, do you get a call from somebody with the Phillies? That's like, Hey, welcome to the oh, team. Yeah. Or, yeah. So the Astros, um, front office called me first, broke the news. Um, once, once they talked to me, I, I guess they work it out where there's like a little grace period, so so they could talk to you first. So the Astros told me once that phone call ended, I think the news you know went public, and after that, you know I I was on the phone you know every day for the next week or so meeting two or three different people from the Phillies just trying to meet everyone, especially with the, you know, impen, you know, the, the lockout, like yep. kind of on the horizon, everyone kind of sensed it coming. So like, I felt like it was just every, everyone in that Phillies org was like trying to, to call me within that first week. So we could, you know, unofficially meet before the lockout started. Yeah. So that's, and that's a great transition to <clears throat> sort of our, our, I guess you could say one of our final questions on, on your baseball aspect um you know obviously there's a lockout going on obviously mm -hmm. you before we even get into the lockout going into this season hypothetically let's say everything's on schedule and you're down in uh would probably be i think tampa or, or wherever the uh the philly spring spring training you know complex is going into this season for you and i'm sure they're probably the same goals but what what are the aspirations you find yourself looking towards going into this season, knowing that you've been a contributor at the major league level, you're on right. a new team. What, what does that look like for you as far as your approach going into this season? Yeah, I, I think I'm just, you know, I've, I've strung together two or three really, really good years. I just want to keep that rolling. Um, you know, nothing, nothing too out of the ordinary from a strictly baseball standpoint. I think, not, I think the biggest thing is just kind of like establishing you know, relationships with all the different players and staff and, and getting to learn, you know, how the Phillies operate and, and how they go about their business and trying to, you know, kind of, kind of carve out how I want to attack that. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I said, from the, from the actual baseball standpoint of it, they'll just want to try and get guys out. Simple as that. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Sounds about right. It's a pitcher. Um, I mean, and it goes into, like I mentioned the second part, there's a lockout going on. So how, how are you staying? I mean, I know t probably every guy is finding a way, right? A, a indoor facility or p people that are maybe in, uh, you know, cold weather areas, they can't go down to Tampa or they can't go down to Florida or Arizona. How are you finding yourself staying prepared, staying focused on baseball and not the rest of this right. other stuff going on? Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's not too difficult. I mean, it's, everyone does it all off season, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's basically just, you know, it's, it's more of the same as training in the off season. Just the difference being, you're kind of starting to get that itch now because you right. know you're supposed to be in Florida. So, um, so yeah, I mean, it's like I said, just, it's just a set, essentially an extended off season. At least that's how I've been treating it. So I know my training has been uh, pretty much the same um as it has been you know in in previous months and years this time of year yeah is there any like you, you know you mentioned uh when you were ready for the call to the big leagues is there like bags are packed right now or or do you sort of have not that maybe you can't disclose yeah. this information but you know you're getting told like hey man we still have another month of this shit like we still or like right. get your bags packed like what you know is it are you ready to go tomorrow if if this thing gets lifted or is it still you feel like maybe a little bit more time left 
Yeah. Um, I, my bags aren't packed, um, <laughs> but it's a little bit different because from my understanding, we will have, you know, whenever the CBA is agreed upon, there is going to be a little bit of time for us to get there. Sure. You know, it's not like the call up scenario where it's like, Hey, I'm, I know I'm going to be there the next morning. I don't think that'll be the case. I'm sure we'll have a few days, especially considering, you know, there's international players, players that are, you know, and for me, it's a seven hour drive. So it's yeah. not, I'll just drive down from Atlanta. It's really an easy, it's not a hard travel travel for me. So, um, yeah, so ba- bags aren't packed, but, uh, but I could get, I could get ready and get down there pretty quickly. So nice. I'm not, I'm not too worried about, uh, about having them yeah. sitting here ready to rock and roll right away. Yeah. And that's, I mean, that was kind of our last question on the baseball aspect of it is, I mean, again, don't know if you can disclose this or not, but are you getting word from anybody? Like, you know, we find out on Twitter, that's how everybody finds out. It's like, Oh, not a lot of right. movement today and this and that, and we're still pretty far yeah. off. And are you, you know, is there like a memo that goes out or is there anything? And it's like, Hey, here's an email this is what we got covered yeah. today. This is when we expect to start. Is there anything like that? Or if, if you can even give that, if you can't, no worries, but is there no, any yeah, updates? We, we get, we get um, memos and, and updates via email from the, uh, MLB from PA. the PA. But, but to be honest, um, that, so that usually comes at least when I get them, it's usually, I, I get them. It's late at night. Usually, usually you can find, Usually Twitter will know before we yeah. know. Seriously, yeah. Usually, usually the reporters will, that are on site will get it right away, and you know we'll get we will get the update and the memos from the PA. But typically, it's stuff we already learned earlier in that day from from the reporters. So you know, very very rarely is it um, very rarely do we get information about the negotiations that uh, that you can't. They, at least on the big things sure. that you can't find, uh, you know, publicly. Yeah. So, yeah, that's how, yeah. I mean, you hear that all the time. Guys get traded and they're like, I, I haven't heard anything, but it sounds like Jeff Passan tweeted that I'm traded, you know, or I'm picked up. Like, it's crazy that that's, right. that's the world yeah. we're in. But, um, I mean, yeah, that, that wraps up the baseball questions. We wanted to shoot off some quick rapid fire one word questions, right. non baseball okay. related to just get our minds off of it because as much as we want to talk about it, um, there's not much going on, unfortunately. So these are non-baseball, and you can give detailed if you want, or you can give you know one-word answers because it's it's pretty straightforward questions here. Uh, okay. Number one, you're at the steakhouse. You order a yeah. you order a, a ribeye. How do you like it yeah. cooked? It's it's medium rare. It's always medium rare. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Outside of baseball, top three hobbies. Oh man. Okay. Well, one, one is got to have a big asterisk next to it because I haven't been able to the last couple of years, but I do love to golf. I wish that my arm would be agreeable, more, a little more agreeable last couple of years where I could golf a lot. Yeah. In normal circumstances, golf, certainly. Um, I would say, I would say I like to, uh, I, I mean, I don't know. I'm just a social, I'm a social guy. I like going out <laughs> with all my friends, whether it be going to NBA games or going out to do whatever, like whatever. I just like hanging out with my yeah. friends and, and family really. Um, but yeah. And then I'd say, uh, third, I'm a, I'm a bit of a movie buff too. I like okay. to watch a bunch of movies too. So I'll, I'll go movies for three. Nice. It's a good list. Cool. Um, yeah. if you had to choose as a pitcher, would you prefer a hundred degrees in Arizona or 95 yeah. degrees in Florida? Uh, dry heat or what or humid heat as a pitcher so <laughs> in terms of being comfortable arizona certainly yeah however being a pitcher i'm gonna want that humidity it's gonna help it's gonna help it uh performance wise yep. so i'm gonna pick florida yeah get that heavy air no homers yeah and lo- yeah. ball spinning more you, go. you got that sweat going yeah. a little bit yeah 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 absolutely all right What's your favorite TV show? Oh, um, oh, it's so cliche. I don't want to say it, but it's probably The Office. It's probably The Office. <laughs> Hard to go against it. Great call. I'll say, I'll say The Office is probably my favorite. I'll say the best show. What I think is the best show is probably Breaking Bad. Okay, but um, but that's not like 
It's good. It's not like I'm rewatching Breaking Bad episodes like you read The Office, you know. So absolutely, that's more the comfort thing. Those those are definitely blue chips, though. Yeah, blue chip shows. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, If you had, if you had to pick, let me let me start this question over. They come to you. Paramount Pictures comes to you, and they say, "We're going to make a movie about Kent." And you have to pick, you get any choice of any actor in the world to play Kent Emanuel it, oh, as, as the main actor in a movie. Who are you picking to play you in a movie? Can, can you at least give me a, uh, a movie genre? It's a baseball movie. Action. It's about, it's about, uh, oh, it's okay. about your it's life. Actually, it's a biographical. Oh, okay. Okay, okay, yeah. Okay. 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 Um, gosh, that's a tough question. That's a tough question. Hugh Jackman. Hugh Jackman. That's my answer. Okay. Yeah, the Wolverine. Get the Wolverine in there. With Get the facial the hair and everything. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Yeah. That's that's my pick. That's nice. My pick. Okay. That's a good answer. I mean, I was thinking, I you know, it's easy to go with the cliches too, though. Go with, uh, like, uh, I mean, I would say Dennis Quaid just because I've seen him in, in The Rookie or... Uh, Somebody, yeah. Yeah, some baseball um, guy, you know, or... Um, and... Uh, what? Why can't oh I think God. of his name? Oh yeah, we're probably Kevin thinking. Costner. Yeah, Costner would be He's a great one. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 but a yeah, younger yeah. Costner, you know, not a sixty-five-year-old Costner. <laughs> but yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, and then last question here. Uh, don't know how much of MLB the Show you play. How do we feel about the rating they have for you at sixty-seven overall in MLB the Show? Oh, astronomically low obviously i don't know what you expect <laughs> me to say to that no I, I i don't play the show really though either so honestly i it's probably a good thing i don't because i could envision myself playing as myself and getting pissed off anytime yeah. i <laughs> yeah well that's what i was gonna say they have so they have you have they got a four seam for you at 92 they got okay. a sinker at 91 is that a sinker or is it you, you call it a two seam or do you think it's a sinker I throw, I throw, I just throw sinkers. I don't even throw a four seam. So, oh, okay. That's obviously a little bit off. Yeah. They, yeah. I mean, yeah, I think they got every guy a four seam. Yeah. It just seems to be one of those things where, like, when, when they don't know him quite yet, they don't have like the perfectly accurate pitches for him. You'll see like a guy that doesn't throw a curveball at all have a huge curveball in that game. Yeah. They what, have, else, what else do like, they have? What they have four seam at 92, sinker at 91, curveball coming in at 78. Does that sound accurate? No, but okay, I'm that's fine. To hear the rest. <laughs> and then the last pitch they have is a slider at eighty-five. That's what it's got on Velo. And I was going to ask yeah. you: do you do you call it a slider, or is it more of a cutter, or is it a slurve? Like, what would you call that so, pitch if you have had to yeah, name it? I've, so my repertoire is the following: I throw the sinkers. Um, I very rarely throw curveballs, but I do have a pretty big slow curveball. Um, and then I have a very sweepy slider and a changeup. Okay, well they don't have changeup on there, so we got to give them a call and yeah. get that fixed because that's yeah. yeah, we should we should have known that he had a changeup. No, we I think changeup is actually off my it. number one off speed thrown. Really? So it's crazy that. Yeah, I mean, we yeah. knew you had it. It's just I'm just reading off what they have on there and I'm just seeing if that's yeah, accurate. No, they, yeah. I just need to. We're gonna have to have a uh, word. Need to get more reps for them to, yeah. to tweak it. I guess. Yeah, that's it. Just yeah. just get out next year and strike a bunch of guys out with your changeup, and they'll they'll modify that's it, right. bring you up to a diamond, that's right? right? Um, that's right. Yeah. Well, I need to get out of the '60s, man. Sheesh. No, come on. There's plenty of guys that started down there. This I mean, year. Yeah. <laughs> this year. This yeah, is yeah, your we'll year. Get, yeah, we'll see you up in gold, and you'll be uh you'll be a hot commodity in the game because everyone needs the can of manual card to, they probably, Jared, now that I'm thinking about it, they should, they always come out with these cards uh, just for your knowledge, Kent, that's like a, it's like a card of a guy, but it's about a specific moment. So like they had one for Kike Hernandez in the postseason, and it was like a 99 diamond because he went off. Right. And it was about his yeah. performance in the series. How did they not make a Ken Emanuel major league debut card, like a 97 overall, like left-handed, comes out of the bullpen in his big league debut and just shoves. I mean, that's that's oh, that's, a, that's a disgrace. They should have come out with something. I mean, <laughs> I don't know, but uh, yeah. I mean, anyways, that that'll pretty much wrap it up. I mean, obviously, can't we? We really, really appreciate uh, you know you making the time. It's been almost two hours now, so we really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to to talk to us. Cause, yeah, no problem. Yeah, man. We we no wanted problem. to get some insight, and uh, obviously, you've had a bit of a more unique experience than maybe some guys, but everyone's got a different path and that's kind of the goal we wanted to get to is find out, you know, your path to the show. And, and, um, right. 
at the end of the day, we obviously hope the best for you now because we'll see you with the Phillies. And, and if we did leave you with anything, be sure to get friends with uh, our buddy, our buddy Julian, because he's you'll probably okay. come across him at some point or another. And yeah, I'm sure I will. Yeah, he's um, yeah, tell him you talk to us and he'll probably he'll probably chuckle because he's playing pro ball, you're playing pro ball, and we're sitting here talking about it. So we're uh, <laughs> we're not quite quite at the level, but we really appreciate uh, it, man. Thanks for coming on and. Um, you know, good luck, obviously, with the rest of the way whenever this thing gets resolved. Nah, no problem, yeah, guys. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, man. We'll talk yeah, to you later. You, good luck. I appreciate you. All right. See you guys. Thanks, Kent. Okay.